you're doing it. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're just going to let people get into the Zoom room here before we get started. Thank you so much for being here. Happy Friday. <laughs> All right. PJ, if you want to get started. Shall we? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do okay. it. All right, guys. Hi. Thank you, Sons. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome back or welcome for the first time. These are monthly-ish webinars where we dig into all sorts of stuff. Today is family discord. Um, fun stuff, complicated layered stuff and common as all get out. Um, so we'll, uh, just a quick reminder or new news for folks who are just joining us. Um, first of all, thank you. These are really just meant to be safe places to think and feel. So uh, Sonia will will show you in a moment how to ask questions or participate. And we'd really love that. These are not meant to be lectures, um, but more we'll set up the subject, you know, from a sort of a professional-ish point of view or from our experience. But <clears throat> that's just meant to be a sort of a leveling and a starting point or something to react to. The fun part of these is the conversation and questions, et cetera. So, um, and then let me just say, so I'm BJ Miller. You guys, I've met many of you before, but joining us today is Dr. Clarissa Rios, who's a longtime friend and colleague and someone who works with us here at Metal and someone I love very much and who makes amazing cookies and does all sorts of things and has great kids and et cetera, et cetera. But I'll let her tell you a little bit more about herself over to you, Clarita. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, is my audio okay, BJ? Yep. Awesome. I am so happy to be here. Yeah, my name is Clarita, and I am a physician. I am currently the head of palliative care for a startup that helps uh, manage the care of marginalized populations. Um, really focus my career on um, getting access to palliative care um, to folks who otherwise wouldn't even know that it exists and is available to them and uh, really passionate about that. And yeah, working here at Metal as well, really enjoying this experience. And um, this is, I think my third one of these, and this I think is the most um, sticky, you know, as I thought about what would come up, this one was really sticky. And, I hope that we get through our slides real quick because I think the audience will have a ton of questions and I think that's really where the juicy stuff is gonna kind of hang out. Right, right on. So yeah, I'll, if you're going on too much, I'll give you a sign. If I'm going on too much, you give me a sign and we'll move to these slides. Um, yeah, awesome. But hey, Clarissa, for, for everyone's sense, because <laughs> your background, do I have it right that you're double boarded in internal medicine and ER and triple boarded in powder care too? Yes, sir. Dang, dang, girl. You are okay. All right. Triple threat. Crazy. All right. <laughs> Another way to say it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Clarissa, and welcome. Yeah. Yet again. Um, Thank you. All right. Well, let's dig in, but first over to Sonia for some nitty gritties. <laughs> to Clarissa's point about the juicy stuff, this is how to get into the juicy stuff. So after mm -hmm. um, BJ and Clarissa have gone through the slides, you can ask questions or add comments. And you can do this in two ways. You can raise your hands and we will unmute you and you can ask your question aloud to Clarice and BJ. If you prefer not to do that, you can just type it into the Q&A section and I will read it aloud for them to address. Um, you can also, you know, as things are kind of going along, you can add things to the chats or do a little shout out to something that someone said. There's lots of ways to interact here, but again, raise your hand. We'll unmute you. You can ask it out loud or you can type it into the Q&A and I will ask it for you. Thanks again for being here. Thank you, Sonia. And Thank reminder, you. guys, again, safe, safe play. You really, honestly, these get pretty intimate. So you can stay or just about any, just about anything here again within the bounds of the basic kindness. So have at it. Okay. Um, Clarita, let's jump in, Mama. Um, yeah. So it seems like a good place to start as sort of what are you bringing into this equation? Like what we walk around with. Uh, we weren't just plopped here and in one moment, we have histories. Um, you must see this come up in a zillion ways. 
Yeah, when I think about discord and I think about um, chronic illness, it's just like um, the heaviness of relationships has a lot to do with like how people show up, right? And so I think it's really important as you're thinking, as you're in the presence of someone with illness or like navigating their care or having meetings, bringing people together, cannot forget that the drama you had when you were five, when you were a teenager, when you were relating to your parents, um, especially if the parent is a sick person, that all that stuff is going to um, come forward. And the way you see yourself in the family, in the relationship, in the friend circle, that also is going to inform what um, what happens and, and how you relate um, and stuff might bubble up. Um, so important to, to think about. Yeah. And it's also true. It's not like, like I've, met, I've worked with a lot of people who have been through so much and then, so the next thing happens and they're surprised at how upset they get or cause they've seen it before or whatever else. It's, I, I don't know how, are we ever sort of free of our past? I don't, I don't know, but we certainly, it certainly pays to process and deal with our lives as we go. So we don't acquire a huge sort of um, shadow or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, just parts of our experiences that are stuffed into a closet because they affect how we behave. Of course, they affect how we relate with each other. Like you said, include to the stories we tell ourselves we bring into that mix. So. Part of what this slide for me too is just a nod for us, encouragement for each of us to tend to ourselves and our relationships along the way. Because <clears throat> when, not if, when illness or trauma befalls us, or people we love, those are enormous stressors. And I think that we all presuppose or like to, or I do, gosh, this is a tragedy befalling a family. And of, of course, this is the moment they're going to rally and come together and everyone's going to let bygones be bygones. And we're going to just... That is, I don't know why I ever absorbed it. That that is, of course, that's not what happens. That's a huge stressor, and in a lot of ways, we sink to our most sort of, uh, not our lowest selves, but we get to the brainstem, our deepest, oldest selves come, start coming out. So, the stress of illness is not just another moment, and it's not likely to magically turn your relationship into something super easy. Actually, quite the opposite. It's it pours gas on a lot of fires. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Mama. In deference to your earlier comment, let's keep on trucking. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, yeah. What do you think here? I. Yeah. So I think um, one of the important things, and Sonia, so we're talking about this this um, uh, webinar. This came up, and it was so. It's so funny because obviously we do this work, but every now and then somebody will say something. And I'll be like, yeah, that's really important. And that's what happened here. Um, mm -hmm. the, the sick person, the loved one, that is the focus of um, everybody's attention has a different relationship with everybody, right? And so it's really important to take that into consideration when you're advocating for them, but also when you're faced with others' emotions, right? Um, and, or when you're having a tough time with that person themselves, um, often a father or a partner, when you think about those um, uh, roles, um, who is sick becomes probably more dependent than they may have been prior. And that may um, cause a lot of friction um, between their partner or their child and them, that may be completely different than if there's a sibling relationship or a friend relationship. And so I think it's important to note that, um, to remember it, call it out. And then what I find helpful when, when Sonia brought this up and got me thinking about it is how do you leverage then the fact that you have different relationships um, or that the, the sick person may have different relationships to help um, broker um, a plan or build a bridge or be a source of 
oh shit, this is really hard and I want to pull my hair out and I need to mm -hmm. vent to someone and your relationship is different so I can go to you. Um, it's important to note it, but I think it's, it's um, in, in times of discord or difficulty, it's also um, helpful to kind of get that village that, and find the people who may be able to help you navigate um, the friction because they're different relationships. And so that's, um, as we talked about it, that's kind of the way I, I thought of this um, idea. Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, and also, I mean, it all goes all ways. I mean, your comments, like uh, everything in these conversations, generally, whether you are yourself the patient or the caregiver, family member, friend, someone stuck caregiving for someone, like you said, the phrase loved one. We, I catch myself here too all the time. We, we have to remember that <laughs> not all these dynamics are loving. You might find yourself in these roles, either patient and being cared for by someone whom you don't love or care, you know, it's just complicated, um, but these comments go in all directions. So if you're the patient, um, you know, being sensitive to understand a lot of people may be seeing these other relationships for the first time you have. And sometimes that can be jarring. And um, I think I think the benefit of the doubt goes in all directions. Yes, the patient has all these different roles and different relationships with different people. And, and like it says here, each one is a world unto itself. Each one has all sorts of stuff going on in it. And then you put them together in a room with multiple relationships and the, the math gets dizzying. But I think the point here, among others, is simply to give each other that space. We're complex beings. We have relationships of all sorts of stripes with all sorts of people. And each of those has its place. And yeah. each of those relationships is affected differently to varying degrees. And there's got to be space for all of it, one way or another. Yeah. And Virginia wrote something in the chat that I find so mm -hmm. perfect, especially because it's something that is going on personally for me. She wrote, yes, and to remember that as people involving their end of life care, we are coming in at the end of mm. the story. They have mm. generations of familial patterns in place by the time mm. that we show up. And Virginia, it's like you have been in my life for the past couple of weeks. <laughs> um, uh, so if it's okay with everybody, I wanted to share something. I am... Um, adjacent to someone who is at end of life is a cousin of um, my uh, partner um, and their relationship is a distant one. Um, this gentleman is very interesting um, hermit type person. Um, mm -hmm. They're at end of life and I've been sort of adjacent and kind of like peeking in and going like, oh, are we talking about how is this? And are we talking about goals? And, and <laughs> How is he feeling and things of that nature and just trying to be really um, uh, because of my culture and because of what I do really like I'm here I want to help <laughs> that's mm. that's just the way I work mm. and it's so important um, it's been it's been a really interesting learning experience for me to just say this is not how this family does things um, I have to be so mindful. And I actually, um, to your point, BJ, you got to call it out and bear witness to the fact that like it's happening, right? So first see it and then call it out and say, oh, wow, I'm feeling like I'm seeing something happening and I want to stop it. And I want to show up for you guys. And you guys do things differently. Forgive me for kind of rushing in. Um, but how do I show up for you? And that's how we were able to sort of find the place. They were like, yeah, come on in. But mm -hmm. it just, the way in which I was approaching it, I don't think, even though I do this for work, y'all, um, mm. uh, was not taken into cons consideration the familiar pattern, the behavior, the the kind of stoic way that they that they love. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, gotta gotta think about those patterns and the culture and the history. And you made it explicit, Clarita. Did you did you talk this out in one way or another? Yeah. yeah. So, so of course, everybody in, in uh, my partner's family knows what I do for work, and so I said, "Hey, at any point, if anybody's interested, I'm here." But at one point, I just had to say it. Well, oh, I, I feel it. I just said, "I'm coming on strong, huh?" Um, hmm. Can we talk about this? And 
and it was a lovely conversation, but one that could have, um, had it not happened, I think there would have been some discord. Well, nice catch, my friend. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, you're making me think too, sometimes we, it's a, it's a tangent on from your story. Um, I, I'll catch myself as the, the cap out of care doc. Cause I get this privileged time with a patient and I feel like I know the scoop or the story. And then I'll meet a family member or friend and all of a sudden it sounds a little different. And if I'm not, I, I'll catch myself thinking that I know I have some inside scoop of what this really is or should be. And then other characters come in and it gets much more complicated. And if I'm not careful, I'll hold all those other relationships to my first blush with this person. I think I somehow have, and I'm not saying you're doing that. It's just sort of how we all accidentally forget our own subjectivity in these roles and that we're our own messy humanness and that we have, these are style points, not objective truths, et cetera. So, and I don't know that the, the pressure's off of us just because we do this for work. In fact, in some ways, I think moving from doing this professionally to actually when it's in our families, I think we can be extra clunky. Um, one doesn't necessarily prepare you for the other. 100%. I totally agree with that. Um, yeah. There's a few other things in the chat. Um, mm. should, we, should we keep going, um, Sonia, or should we read them? What, what makes the most sense? It's kind of up to you. You know, I, we can, um, there are some great comments here. Just kind of, I can read one of these just yeah. to add insight as the youngest of four kids. I have witnessed how each child has a different parent. Indeed, oldest and youngest mm. grew up with parents who were at greatly different times in their lives. So just a, a nod to, mm. <laughs> yes, we all have a different relationship with the same person. Yeah. And that can make that person seem like a different person. The person we thought we knew, but we know them in one way, you know. So, mm. yeah, well, well shall we keep on trucking, or is there more? Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Of the teamwork here. Okay. Yeah. This is a message that's come up in talks one way or another. Like this role switching, even if it's filled with love. Like, of course, I want to care for my partner, or my. Aunt. Um, but changing those roles changes the dynamics, which changes the relationships. Um, this comes up a lot. I'm assuming you see it a ton, Clarita. Yeah. Or maybe you're feeling it in your own family, like you were saying. Too. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think one of the, um, there's a lot of things that come up here. Um, I, as I was thinking about the talk today, I was thinking about um, the, the the loved one who has a serious illness. I was looking at this from that perspective, and hopefully other folks can can speak about um, the caregiver perspective or the partner perspective. But I often, um, you know, I, I think we all know that the sick person, the loved one, or the person with the serious illness, is actively physically feeling their illness and so they're in a constant state of like existential distress little a lot a ton um or maybe just a reminder of their mortality right a reminder of what they can and cannot do and it is um super intense for them it is uh it's the culture being gender being another thing um all these things impact um, how this illness affects you. And I often, uh, and certainly my work at metal find um, partners or um, relationships where there's a shift in who's doing most of the housework or who's bringing in the bacon or who's uh, making the other person laugh. Um, when that shifts, um, there is a lot of discord that can come up because it is, a, you know, the sick person is constantly being reminder, reminded of what they can and cannot do by virtue of seeing somebody make their meals to help them get dressed. And it doesn't always come with a, it's not always gratitude and reflection, right? Mm -hmm. It can be resentment. It can be uh, anger that you can't hold. And so you project onto your loved one. And 
you know, in, in some of the work that I do, you know, I, I try to just explore with folks. And I'm always so impressed with people's ability to kind of um, uh, unpack that when you call it out. Um, I don't know that, you know, everybody's going to be able to have a BJ or a Clarita or, you know, a metal counselor around, but but uh, what, as I think about how do we, how can we um, dig into that with, with a sick person, um, I'm a big fan of um, thinking about from their perspective, you know, talking about how are you doing today and, you know, um, what, what's it like and, and um, how do I show up for you? And, and those things can help people kind of open up a little bit, but um, yeah, it's just interesting. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, Vijay. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if I hear, you know, one, one of the things I'm hearing you point to is in a lot of ways, we're calling out the messiness or the complexity. You know, the messiness sounds judgy. Complexities of, of what's playing out. You know, no matter who's what, who who's in the bed, who's adjacent, etc. One thing to our point here is to just help us all remind ourselves how complex or rich uh, that field is, and how tricky it is to navigate. But it's also fascinating to navigate, and you get to see these other dimensions of people. There's also all sorts of surprises that can happen here. Um, in these changing roles and all sorts of all sorts of powerful stuff can happen here too. It's not just all hazard. And I think what maybe makes the difference is, among other things, certainly is 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 your one's ability to stay present with what's happening now and and start from there. To your point of like, how's the day? How are you today? How are you? You know, put it get present now. All the the underwater part of that is are these icebergs will reveal themselves through this present lens. Um, you don't necessarily have to drudge up past per se, but just go to the, the moment. And then this way, if you stay present in the moment, you kind of move in time with, with folks and these relationships stay up to the minute in a way. Um, yeah. So well, shall we keep on? Shall you read, was yeah. there more to say here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's keep going. Sonia, again, as always, beautiful job with the artwork. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> uh, wait, did you, so the stress illness effect, is this a thing? I mean, is this, or is it more simply like stress and illness? Or illness causes stress, stress causes illness, and there's a little loop between the two and they compound. Or is there something more to this? Uh, yes and no, I think. I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, stress is stress, right? And we know a lot about it, you know, for as, as physicians, we know a ton about what it does and how it impacts, you know, your mood and, and um, uh, the way you perceive symptoms, et cetera. But, but yeah, I think that there's also the illness piece of this and how, um, uh, you know, stress from the illness uh, or the physical manifestations of the illness can really, um, and I think of it um, a lot in like folks with neurological issues um or diagnoses shall i say um there is a, a ton of interrelational impact that memory issues uh, being aware of memory issues can have on a person's mm. mood a person's ability to, to relate to others um and and i guess it all goes back to it's all it's all stress. It's all um, your body or your mind not, or your spirit not being able to to manage these things that are being um, presented or these things that you're feeling. Um, and I think that what I what I know for sure is that we underestimate the impact of this in the interpersonal relationships mm -hmm. um, in the general population. You said this, and I, and I think Sonia has said this in the past, like it's not all going to be rosy, like, oh, mom is dying. Let's just be best friends again. You know, uh, that's not that's not a thing, right? Um, and <laughs> it, that's never a thing, folks, ever. Um, it can be. And, and, you know, I think somebody <laughs> made a comment of an experience they had where 
one parent died and there was one experience and then the the more recent death of the, in the family caused a lot of friction and it's um you know different diseases can impact the patient differently the length of the disease can impact people differently i'm amazed about how interpersonal relationships and patients with neurodegenerative disorders um, within a family can be different so have have a patient whose relationship with the son is a certain way still very sweet the daughters all the daughters not going great that's causing um, a lot of distress um yeah so i, I don't know that i answered your question and i think mm-hmm. i went into a tangent but yeah it's all this it's all related it's all, but it's go all ahead. the mix it's all <laughs> the mix yeah i mean i think i'm just hearing in yet another reason to stay as best as possible to stay present that doesn't mean forgetting your past it means pre- being present with those feelings too but like you're saying illness stress the loop between the two these things will change a person and they will change the relationships and unless you find ways to move with those changes the shifting reality you will find yourself out of sorts with yourself and with each other and one way and another we know this to be true of stress too there can be a good upshot of stress it can force us to make decisions to prioritize it can can, stress can uh help us sort of learn to accommodate pain i mean there's it's not all negative in fact in some ways maybe we could just take the adjectives out here but one way or another again i think it feels like feels like one of the messages here is find ways to move with these realities as they shift. And one of the most painful things I ever witness is when someone, whether it's a patient or a family member or whatever, someone's finally cracking open. They've been very, say, stoic or cold or something impersonal. And finally, this illness or whatever it is finally cracks them open and, you know, emotions start flowing. And I've watched some families where uh it scares people like oh dad used to be so stoic I, I don't who's this guy it freaks me out and then they're sort of wiping off the tears and not letting dad have his finally have his emotions you know so it's just an example i come back to again in my own mind I, i've seen it a lot and it it, it, it gets to me and i it's, so one way or another again i'm sorry to go on it's just sort of this message of finding ways to be true to the past sure yes and move with this reality because it is shifting this is not a static picture period um yeah so yeah, I think probably a tangent it, on a tangent but yeah but if there's a headline in this in this talk and in the work we do is that um things change mm-hmm. and change is in, inevitable and um i think especially in relationships uh paternal maternal relationships and and um or if the child is a is a sick person that there is this thing we do to ourselves where we there's a snapshot of what mom mm-hmm. should be like what dad should be like and and um and yeah i love that it's like it, it all changes and you have to sort of and i hate saying this because it 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 can add to more stress but there's something about this presence and like you know mm-hmm how how can i be in this moment and something that that i in my own personal life i'm trying to do more is sort of um i'm hanging on to the past or i'm thinking about what's coming up in the future and like trying to come up with like practical ways of like be in the moment what are you feeling where is it in your body um mm-hmm. and uh and yeah um it, it it's it proves to be helpful um cool awesome <laughs> okay all right we'll keep on moving oh gosh yeah um you want to kick us off you want me to jump in this one was important for us to discuss because i think Hmm. as we deal with especially family discord i mean there's um difficulty in coming up with a plan for a sick loved one or there's division or shall we say drama in mm-hmm. in sort of the the village the caregiving group for a sick person often where i find i can make the most impact is by really calling upon all participants to think about the intention um and the reason why they're all there and the reason why all the emotions are coming up 
Um, and so kind of getting back to the, the basics, which is we love this person or we have a responsibility to this person or um, uh, I have a sense or a sense of duty. Um, kind of coming back to the intention, it sometimes of the, I feel is really helpful way of kind of grounding people and getting everybody on the same page. So in terms of like um, kind of conflict resolution, that that feels like a nice um, uh, starter starting point, um, and and I find it helpful in in my work and and just in general to kind of like get down mm -hmm. to what's at the root of all this. Right on, and to remind each other of that, I think this comes up. I remember when more hospital work where families would be you know, agonizing over a big decision of whether treatment or no treatment, you know, leave, leave mom on the respirator, take you know, big, big questions. And there, and it can get progressively hotter and hotter and the tension gets builds and builds and people are kind of retreating into kind of holding a piece of ground, something that might feel solid and it can get really hot and hot and, and really, mm, not very constructive and you find yourself making decisions or decisions being made in a very reactive state and sometimes walking into that dynamic uh and reminding everyone like okay that's, that's like you're saying okay guys what's what are we doing here what's most important for example like you say like i'm afraid if we do this next treatment that we're actually gonna i know you want dad to live longer i know you and i do too but I'm really afraid that this, if we pursue this next treatment, that we're gonna actually cause harm. You know, I know that's not what we would mean to, right? With no one here wants to cause harm. No one wants dad to suffer, right? And then very often, most everyone will agree to that. And then, the, and then we have, we've re-centered ourselves in something a little bit more emotional and heartfelt and yeah. very real. And then we can make much better decisions from that place. So this is sort of a, a case in point, but and I don't know, this matters to me in my own family life and my, if I can, or, or being able to look in the mirror, if I know, do I mean well here? Am I trying? You know, if I can answer that question or if the person I'm talking to, do they mean well? Like that makes so much difference. If I know that that, if I can believe in that intention of myself or others, that unlocks a lot of potential to the relationship. If that's not in place, if I can't believe that or trust that, then we're in a whole other batch of something a little more hellish. Um, and not to say that intention is everything. It's not like oh, I meant well and I shot your dog. You know, like, uh, <laughs> no, I'm like, you know, not. It's not. It's not sufficient. You know, but it's invaluable, irreplaceable. Meaning well actually matters. Really, really does. And very often you can also feel it it translates somewhere in your gut or somewhere you can tell when someone means well even if they're saying crazy things or hurtful things yeah so the big yeah one. i love that um it reminds me of a case that i had where the sisters were just going at it and going at it and just like mom wanted it, mom wanted it, mama. Mm. and um i think it was so helpful to kind of get back to the intent so why are we here why does that matter and realize that Yes, everybody wants mom to be okay, but the fight was about, um, the intention there was about, I have a history with my sister and I, I just, I want to, I just, I really want to hurt her now. And, mm -hmm. and this is what needs to happen. And once they were able to kind of like, oh my God, this isn't about mom, this is about us. They were mm -hmm. like, okay, let's take a step back. And it, I don't think after the mom, her, their mother had died that it was all beautiful, but they were able to come together at that point and say, um, wait a minute. Okay, let's take a step back. What mm -hmm. would mom want? Yeah, you're right. Let's, let's, and it was to send her to hospice and, and a particular mm -hmm. uh, care plan. Um, so yeah, just intention. Like what's the intention? What's my intention? Um, and I think if we can at least keep ourselves in tech, then it's just, it can build from there. Yeah. Yeah. Then the exercise is actually just learning to say what we actually mean, do what we actually mean. But 
starts with figuring out what you mean. And that's yeah. a, really, it's a really good place to start. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Quick note before you guys move yeah. on. Um, someone mm -hmm. who just said something about, um, in addition to the intention matters, it was action also matters. As a caregiver, yeah. it becomes clear pretty quickly who's going to be helpful. And those are the mm -hmm. relationships I feel are most important to tend to when energy is limited. Just wanted to add that. Right on. At the bottom, yeah, amen. That's what I mean. Like intention by itself is is inadequate, is not enough. It's not enough. Um, right. Especially when there's so much of stuff that actually has to happen. We got to do stuff. It's not just a frame of mind we're talking about. So I hear you. Thank you for that comment. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, and there okay. I say that intention without action is just, I don't what know. What is that? I, I, what is that you know like nah. oh hope he does okay and uh, no like <laughs> how do i show up for you right so i'm with you that was beautiful thank you for that comment yeah amen well so now this question you know so how whether you're a patient or caregiver again any sort of role agnostic here like especially in the context of serious illness chronic illness terminal illness where in general things at best maybe from a physiologic point of view, plateau for a while. Maybe there's some improvements here and there, but in general, it's sort of a one-way street to death. And so in this dynamic, in this context, how the hell do you gauge what am I am I doing right? Is this working, not working? Because it's if we if we hang our hat on whether or not the, the patient, whether that's ourselves or someone we love, is getting better, well, uh, that is that's not really often possible or not permanently possible in our context so then how do you know if if what you're doing is is okay it's actually helpful it's a good thing how what what the heck is success in this content and i'm sorry in this context sorry i'm repeating myself so i don't know yeah. if there's an answer i don't know what do you think clarissa when you hear that yeah i mean i <sighs> This is a doctor hat, Clarissa, um, hmm. and and I almost think of Danny um, Shamas, who's uh, yeah. yeah, who's one of our colleagues and just a wonderful um, palliative we care doctor, Danny. who I mentor, shall I say, um, <laughs> if I'm allowed to. Um, who always talks about. I think I was her teacher first, though. You were, right, so, you were, yeah, you were. So fair enough. Yeah. Just saying. Fine. Fine. Mm -hmm. um, I had to do a lot of cleaning up. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, I think it, she always says this thing about um, kind of good getting back to the basics and like, what are the goals here? And so, um, so, so I don't know if this is a real answer, but I think it's really individual. So success is really individual. It's ever changing. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, in a serious illness and as people are uh, approaching end of life, one of the things that is always important is to kind of go back to what makes, and again, I'm going to sound very doctor here, but what makes um, for this person's best quality of life and best day possible today, tomorrow, the day after, and knowing that it might change, um, that it's not just the, that what is, what is success to be thought of for the loved one, for the sick person that we love, for the family structure, the friend group, the whatever, right? Um, mm -hmm. And for everybody in that community as well. And hopefully by by meeting the needs and goals of the, of the sick person, you're having sort of this um, community-wide impact that is positive. But it, but yeah, this feels very doctory, but it's like success to me as a, as a, as a provider of palliative care is, making sure that um, that we're meeting the goals um, that we have set forth, understanding that they can shift and change and that we might get at it in a very windy, not perfect mm -hmm. way, that there might be bumps in the road, that we might fail. But as long as we're focused on doing right by this person, um, doing right by our community, that um that we are on the way um if not successful i don't know you, you sound that's doctory but that's 
specific caveat that's palliative care doctor that's not most <laughs> doctors but um but your points i i i i am with you i i mean goal orientation is is bothersome rhetorically to me um and yet we yeah. use it we have it it's it's I, I get what you're saying i'm with you i use the same language but i think one of the points here for folks in the audience and please chime in of course here is I think the point is, is it becomes sort of self-referential. There is this, there is not much in the way of, of objective success. Um, th there might be some, uh, you know, in a medical way, a treatment might work by some metric or something like that. But the, in the world we're talking about here, this is in very subjective stuff. And when you say goals, you're, you're really talking about the patient, the family, what's most important to them knowing that that's an open question and our job is to help them understand the context in which they're making that assessment so that it has a chance of being realistic. But besides that, our, us as this clinician setting that context up, it becomes, it, it's very self-referential, very subjective. So this is part of the answer to the question here is a lot of good communication making sure everyone in the, in, the, in the picture who's making decisions understands the big picture. So they're being asked to make realistic decisions. And then, and then we do the work of, of, of evincing and people articulating what's important to them. And that may be a scoop of ice cream. That may be success, you know, that may, whatever, literally pretty much whatever it is, but it is, we're trying to, it's a self-referential loop. Ideally, the patient tells us what success looks like one day to the next one, moment to the next, and we go for that. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the big points here is to divorce ourselves from the idea that there's some objective success gold star that we're going to get. Sometimes it's just success is making things a little less horrible that moment or a little better than they could have gone. Something like that. And I love that you said that because I think that even in the way that I answer that, it was sort of a little floofy and a little flowery. And the reality is that we need to get really real about this. Um, and often things that cause friction in families or things that give people feelings is this idea that the end has to be a perfect, the end has to be painless, the end has, I mean, the end has to be this like soap opera, kind of like I went off to sleep and I still had a, a face full of makeup. Like, that's not always going to be the case. It is a very unique experience for everybody and everybody's village. And um, so, yeah, thank you for calling that out. It is really important to, to really speak to that. Um, mm -hmm. You're not responsible for someone's cancer. You're not responsible. You didn't cause it. That's what I mean. You didn't cause mm -hmm. the cancer. You didn't cause the dementia. These things are tough and hard and we've been trying so hard to prolong people's lives and just haven't figured out how to do that in a way that honors their humanity yet. And so, and we're a whole medical community with scientists and doctors and all these folks. Don't put the pressure on yourself or your village in making something that is really difficult to impact um, fully. Um, your responsibility, it shouldn't be on your shoulders. Yeah. Thank you for calling that out. That's really important. Yeah, and success is not a miracle, in other words, and we don't get to call those. And it's really, did we do the best we can? Oftentimes, it's really, it's not a very inspired question, but it's maybe all we have. Yeah. Um, so, all right, Mama. I think this is our last slide. Yeah. Um, a little bit violent one, but I think we'll make the point. Um, before, before you guys um, head into this one, sorry to interrupt, yeah. um, we had a, a, a chat comment come in from someone mm. who is living with an illness and she just brought up something that I think is important to kind of riff on really quickly, mm. um, that it's a little, for her listening to talking about this feels a little bit like she could be causing suffering to her family and friends who may be taking care of her, who may be part of that care circle. So I'm just wondering if there's a moment to kind of talk about family discord or the relationships from the patient perspective, just for a quick moment. Oh, gosh. Clarita, did you want to say something there? Otherwise, I need to ask you to reread that. I'm sorry, I just got an emergency note coming in here. Could you reread yeah. that comment, Sonia? I'm so sorry. 
Yeah, yeah, no problem. Just um, the person is a, a quote unquote patient. They're living with an illness and talking. This feels like it's um, from the perspective of, you know, people who are caring for that person or in mm -hmm. the care circle and just thinking about family discord from the view of the patient instead of the other way around. So she's just saying it's, it makes her mm -hmm. feel like um, she may be causing suffering for her family and friends. So that's a difficult thing to hear. So just wanted to just throw that out mm -hmm. there because we like to have all the different perspectives in the mix. So just wanted to bring mm -hmm. it up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank uh, you. Sorry, Clarissa, go, go, please. Um, so I wanna say um, thank you for sharing that. I think that this is um, helpful for us. And thank you, Sonia, for bringing up the comment. Um, the comments got away from me. There were like plenty of them. Um, but one of the things that, that they mentioned is I don't have reserves. I am curating my family and suspecting who will be caregiving and I feel guilty um, about how much, um, how much can I advocate for a healthcare team without allowing the old baggage to land on my head um, when I just want peace. I think, um, You know, so somebody, and I know this is going to sound cheesy, and I always come to this because I try, I try to, um, as a provider, like acknowledge the darkness and then just find sort of the little bits of light. Um, two things can coexist, right? You can um, have really strong boundaries to protect your energy and to protect yourself, and have really a um, solid love, respect, and appreciation for these folks that are um, all up in your business. And then the cousin who's like, come, I wanna come visit you, I wanna come visit you. Um, and, and I think that you can, um, I wonder if we can reframe that and say something like, and again, this may just be uh, me trying to fix things. Um, I acknowledge that that's a role that I take on often. Um, when you say you're causing suffering, um, I, I wonder if we can look at it as there's a lot of people that love you that want to show up for you. And there's just a ton of opportunity for um, then to, to be educated on how how it is best for them to show up for you so that everybody everybody wins, everybody gets um, what they need. And as I say that, I, and as an advocate for patients, I feel really strongly that I, of course, want to take care of the family, but, but as the, the person with the illness, that is the priority. And so um, that's kind of what I'm focused on. If we care well for the patient and have really solid, strong boundaries, the two things can coexist nicely. Um, and, and so in your particular case, and I didn't read the, the full um, uh, chat perfectly, but it sounds like there can be some uh, boundary setting um, that really also allows your cousin to show up for you in a different way. Um, so I'll stop there because I think now I'm rambling, but BJ, any, any thoughts there? Well, if I heard the comment correctly, I just I just want to pick up on something you had said earlier, Clarissa. So, yeah, you family member friend didn't cause the cancer, didn't cause the dementia. <laughs> you patient didn't cause the cancer, didn't yes, cause the dementia. I love that. That's 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 about as ground zero as as it gets in terms of all these dynamics. And so each of us needs to do our best to try to remember that for our own sanity's sake. And each of us needs to watch out when we accidentally project or imply uh, that illness is a failure, they did something wrong. It's all over our language. Anyone who's been to our webinars in the past knows we talk, that we set ourselves up with the, how we language illness, et cetera, for such spectacular and unnecessarily unnecessary pain. So, so there's a sort of individual advocacy of reminding yourself and not letting any, uh, reminding yourself that you didn't cause this situation. This is nature, this is life playing out. 
catching each other, projecting, accidentally projecting onto each other some sort of causation. And then if you have any energy left, let's also keep rallying society and c- culture, uh, healthcare system and beyond to rethink these very normal events. So we don't take on baggage, which is not ours to take on. Dying is not your fault. This is what we are programmed to do. Illness is normal, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to overcome a lot of messaging to arrive at that truth. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I love that that statement from the perspective of the patient. You know, you didn't cost this. Um, and I think, you know, using that framework helps with the boundary setting and with um, uh you're just living with the two contradictory things. Yeah. I, I love that. That was really good, BJ. Oh, um, thank you, Klitsa. This is, yeah, I mean, this is life playing through us, through you. This is not, it, it, that's as well how it goes living in a body. You know, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why I cut off over to that, but were you going to say something more, Klitsa? Or should we no, uh, um, I, would love to, I, I know that we're, we're getting close on time, so I don't know if we want yeah. to take questions. I think that the bigger pictures, we, we touched on that yeah. um, here. So would love to know if there's questions that came up in the chat or if yeah. anybody yeah, wants to talk that. off mute. Yeah, that sounds good. Hey, BJ, would you mind closing the, the slides over sure. your beautiful faces for just a brief moment before we go off? <laughs> so um, we did get a question um, early on and it was, your point, Clarissa, what do you do when an estranged sibling wants to just erase history and quote, be family again after years of conflict and the sick parents want none of it? Wait, so I'm sorry. Sorry, my brains. Can you reread it? Yeah, of course. So what do you do when an estranged sibling wants to just erase history and be family again after years of conflict? Um, mm. Yeah, oh, I, I'm chuck. That's not that. That's funny. I'm chuckling because it's it happens not infrequently. Oh, it's it's, it's a it's an interesting. It's truly a, a pattern, and part of that pattern very often is the sibling or relative or friend who is least involved can ostensibly motivated by their own guilt somewhere can come careening in from the side and. <laughs> just try to take over and prove how much they care and criticize other people. And it can just be wildly uncomfortable to watch and really uh, destructive. Um, So one comment is to say that happens a lot. Um, What to do about that? Well, it depends, you know, if you're, if you're the physician or the palliative care clinician in the mix or a loved one or the patient, uh, the answer might be slightly different. But like so many of these things, uh, you might start by noting it and calling it out. Um, and, and then at least we might, folks in the mix might feel a little less crazy. Like, wait, what's happening? Why do I feel this weird way? This person's saying caring things. Why am I upset at them? Or I don't know. Just naming it um, is often very helpful so we don't feel nuts. And so we have a word to react to. Uh, and then lovingly, you know, this is where a good palliative care team or family member who has the emotional bandwidth potentially could sit with that person and say, hey, there's a, kind of call this out. And also kind of look for the love that may be trying to come through too. Maybe they actually feel terrible for being estranged, but, yeah. you know, so that, but finding one way to kind of evince the truth that's happening for that person and to gently or sometimes forcefully reflect that their, however, perhaps lovingly intended um, activism may actually be causing harm and back to, I'm sure this late day, you don't want to come in and actually cause suffering here. Do you let's figure out a different way to exercise yourself in this picture. Um, but it, anyway, it's complicated. Uh, it happens a lot. Best we can do, I think is name it and call it out. And if need be start protecting the patient, this is where an advanced directive with a clearly delineated proxy may be very helpful. If that's an up-to-date advanced directive and say, hey, estranged family member, you're well, good to see you again, but this is the person making the decisions and and, re- and establish that uh, that order. Can that I, can be helpful as a way to cut through. 
Can I interject a question that's just directly related to what you just sure. said, BJ? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, this person said, how do you deal with, with a sibling when the sick parent has put you in charge of their care and the sibling questions everything you're doing? Well, right on cue there and say, this is the, you, there's innocence. Look, you have the advanced directive, mom, dad, whoever, you know, they, I didn't, you know, this is, this is what they've established. This is what they want. We are here to honor their wishes and navigate our own feelings in that mix. And Hey, sis or brother, let's talk it out together. You and me or whatever. But this is, there's, there's, there's a reason mom named me to make these decisions. And I intend to do my best at that. And I'll try to hear your point of view too, et cetera, uh, whatever this sort of diplomacy can flow from that. But yeah. that's part of the power of an advanced directive is can cut through some of those messy dynamics and get right to the buck stops with me. I'm the proxy. Sorry. Yeah. And really calling out that, you know, it, to both questions, the intent piece, right? Like you, um, uh, boundaries and intent, right? So what I'm hearing from you, the reason why you're showing up or the reason why you think I'm making the wrong decisions is because you really want to do right by X, Y, and Z. But in this case, I'm the proxy and, and this is how I'm navigating decision making and I'm happy to discuss things with you. And with the person that's showing up, um, I know that there's a history here. I Like you said, calling stuff out is so important, right? It's it's so key to to either having the person clarify their intent or for you to understand their intent as you as you mentioned but but boundaries are really important and um i want to make a plug not just have a proxy but have really clear discussions about what you want them to do in in your absence in your absence of being able to make medical mm -hmm. decisions of course um yeah that's mm -hmm. that's a good one and that happens often and it's also a nod in the advanced care planning process. This is not always possible. Family dynamics are, as we're saying, complicated. But when you, when any of us is making a filling out our advanced directive, it's one. It's important to put these things in writing. But to the degree possible, communicate those wishes. So it can be a really, it can be a really hurtful reveal in families that it, in the last, in these final moments where things are really stressed and now mom can't say for herself anymore and the advanced directive is revealed and it's, and this person's a proxy and that person isn't and oh, in there's hurt feelings in there, there's all sorts of stuff. If that parent had been able to sit in advance, say, hey, I'm filling out my advanced directives, here's the decisions I'm making and why, well, that's an extra layer of a gift to that family to obviate that really hard, um, reveal um so yeah yes let's all do our advanced directives and let's communicate the meat of those advanced directives directly to the people in our family it's very Absolutely. important hard to do right. um, we've got one other question also about siblings makes me happy i'm the only wow. child in this moment um <laughs> this this last question is what are options if one family member in this case an eldest sibling is trying to cut everyone else in the family from having any sort of care or relationship with parents who both have advanced dementia okay one more time sounds <laughs> What are the options if one family member, in this case, the eldest sibling, is trying to cut everyone else in the family out of having relationship or being able to provide care to parents who have advanced dementia? Mm. Uh, I'm assuming from that question that there isn't a written advanced directive to point to as something of an objective guidepost. Um, right. So part of the part of my response here is not to should have had advanced directive, but just say, ooh, this is one of the reasons why advanced directives are very, can be very important. Um, now, but back to this person's question, what to do? That sounds great. We should have done this, but here we are. Um, well, hmm. like I've said, I think twice in this meeting, I mean, one, like finding your way to actually conversation, sitting around a table, a de-stress way, sitting, not on the fly, do the basic hygiene of a good conversation, of good communication, spend, like, carve out the time, sit, be fed, have drink, you know, so your, your basics are taken care of, close the door, 
and say, you know, hey, we're here because we love mom and dad. This is difficult stuff. Let's see what we can kind of talk through here. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's very helpful to have a third party, depending on the family dynamics. So a palliative care team might be able to broker that conversation or a psychologist or psychiatrist or other kind of counselor, um, or even a really close in family friend who really has some of those skills. But very often a conversation like this needs benefits from some sort of mediation, informal or, or otherwise. So totally. those are some thoughts, yeah. Um, I also wanna say, so from a legal standpoint, it depends where you live and the documents that are available. And so that gets a little tricky, but. I always say start with conversations and I love what you said, right? Like, um, hey, I can tell that you're um, doing, you know, taking all of this on. How do we show up for you? What are some, how, what, what are some of the actions that I can, can take on to, to take some of the load off of you? How do you want us to approach care for mom? Um, and come at it from like a, hey, how you doing standpoint. Um, and we don't know enough about the relationship between the siblings, but it, but it, I wonder if it's, you know, maybe a little bit about the history, right? It's showing up. I'm, I'm sure that the siblings would, you know, take moms to appointments just as well as, as that person would. But I think, you know, digging into like the, how are you doing? And, you know, how do we show up for you um, can be really helpful. If there's documents in place, it, it, it gets a little trickier, but um, but yeah. And, and I'm just looking at a comment, so finally, with you talking, I never look at the chat. I can't, my brain can't, but with you talking, I did. And someone chimed in here. I heard that question as wanting to have a relationship, which is different than wanting to make end of life decisions. Mm, um, thank you, Noah. Mm. So, I think that I think much of the council would be the same because we are trying to go to the relationship on behalf of making end of life decisions, but it can stop it just on behalf of wanting to have a relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think much of the advice is the same. Find a way to try and open up a conversation to name some of the dynamics playing out. Maybe that eldest sibling is doing this because they feel bad about something long ago and they didn't show up and now they're trying to show up in a big, very volume heavy way. Uh, but when, in other words, let's not try to guess what's going on in that family, but let's just say, trying to find a way to naming these issues and simply saying that, hey, big brother, big sister, Maybe you can say what you're doing here is actually helpful, and all that, but but we're here too, and this is a really precious moment. We're not going to have time like this again. As hard as it is, we're going to miss this time, and each of us has relationships with mom and dad that need some space here. So can we find some way to all to all get what we need here? This is happening to all yeah. of us, or something. You know, I'm just making words up, and who knows if that would land in this particular family? Yeah. But I think the council is much the same, which was try yeah. to close the door and talk. And you, you said something really beautiful there, which is just bring it back to the patient, right? So our relationship might be in a tough place or maybe there's a concern about whether it's like you're not taking care of them right or, or there was friction. But I have a feeling that most siblings would say that most parents would want to have their little flock of babies around them at the end of their days. And so intent, I mean, I keep saying this over and over again, so forgive me, but it's like, um, if we can get to, you want to do what's the best for mom, can we look at this from mom's perspective? And I'm assuming that mom would want the children that are cut out of, of, the, um, of the relationship to be part of the relationship. So maybe that's another avenue that, that can be taken to, to really shift the focus back to the, to the sick person. And also, I just want to say that that's really hard. So if that's happening to someone, I just want to say that my my warm and fuzzies, I hope, are transmitting through the computer around you and, and you're getting a virtual hug because that that's a tough one. Um, and as one of my um, uh, mentors used to say, load the boat, get as many people on the boat with you to kind of help broker that um, relationship. But But yeah, just dig into the why. Um, would be my way to handle that. 
Yeah. And maybe there's a pad of care team. If a good pad of care team can hold these kinds of conversations, can foster them. So again, back to maybe the answer here is get some help. Uh, maybe the dynamics among the siblings are just too entrenched to open up such a conversation like we're talking. Um, yeah. Okay. Sounds anything else? I know we're over, but yeah, no, I think we got through it. Um, thank you everyone for your questions and um, participation. We'll put this recording up um, later today. It'll be up there tomorrow to watch. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks yeah. everyone. Thanks, Clarissa. So nice to Bye. be with you. Thanks for Take being care, here. Everybody. Everybody. Everyone. Bye. -bye.